space, you will not get a seat inside. Forget about inside, you won't get place to stand near a window if you go at five. And so I, I was going there at 4.30 in the morning. By then, many of the seats were already taken. I saw that interest uh, to listen to God's word, to spend that uh, quality time with God in the early hours before the stress of the day gets on us. This is a, it's a beautiful idea and I want to congratulate the SA for planning this. Shall we bow our heads and uh, ask God to help us understand the message this morning? Dear Lord, this is your time. We are your people and uh, we give ourselves the time and uh, our hearts, the place, and we ask, Father, that that your sweet spirit will speak to us. That when the message reaches our hearts, we will be sensitive to understand, accept, and apply it in our lives. Draw back the forces of the evil one, that you may receive all the glory, praise, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a book in my hand. It's an old book, um, published in 1977 um, by Wilmonte de Frazee, Ransom and Reunion. I read this book um, 10 years ago, but I, I decided to share something from this. Frazee begins this book with a conversation and a story. Let me share the story first and get into the conversation after that. He talks about <clears throat> a father in uh, Venezuela. This father, he had a son, 13-year-old son, and this boy was kidnapped. And those who kidnapped him demanded a ransom of $900,000, huge amount of money. And the father was willing to pay that huge amount of money as ransom to get his son back. The conversation. Frazee asks his friend, a county judge, he said, Hey, judge, has anyone ever paid a ransom for you? The judge was a Christian, and uh, he was aware of the sacrifice that was paid at Calvary for each one of us. And the judge replied, yes. And Frazee asked, are you worth the price that was paid for you? Are you worth the price? Are you worth the ransom that was paid for you? The judge put his head down and said, I don't think I'm worth the price that was paid for me. And Frazee continued. Frazee said, If you are not worth the price that was paid for you, then God doesn't know anything about value. If you are not worth the price that was paid for you, then Maybe God cheated himself because the one who made you knows your value. That takes us to 
another question what is your value in the sight of god what makes a person valuable in the sight of our creator imagine for a while the father who lost his son 13 year old son is frantically looking around searching for his boy and you bump into him and you say to that father sir i hear that uh, you are uh, you are you're searching for your boy and you are willing to pay 900000 dollars as a ransom i think i have a better idea you don't have to spend so much you can get a boy for 100 dollars in silang do you think the father will be interested i don't think so because the father is not looking for a boy he is looking for the boy his own boy and so he is willing to go to any extent to get his boy back in life we sometimes wonder what is my value am i really of worth because our friends have said to us you are of no value you are a waste or sometimes someone has said to you you are an accident your parents were not even looking for you they were looking for a girl and you were born if you are a boy they were looking for a boy but you were gone you were born a girl you were not wanted in the family what makes a man or a woman a boy or a girl valuable in the sight of god let's go to isaiah chapter 43 verse 21 this is what the creator of mankind says to us he says the people whom i formed for myself will declare my praise the people whom i formed for myself i made you for myself you were needed you were wanted i wanted you and so i made you so you are special you are unique there's no one else like you in this entire universe no one else like you psalm 149 verse 4 god says uh, uh david tells us the lord takes pleasure in whom in his people he takes pleasure in you let me ask you a question who needs whom children needs parents or parents need children what do you think i know that <laughs> we need each other but if you have to zero on one what what would you what will be where will you land children need parents or parents need children <laughs> children need parents parent needs parents need children i'm beginning to think i'm beginning to think i'm a father of two children i'm i'm thinking i'm beginning to think it's dawning upon my mind that parents need children parents need children and this heavenly parent he says i need you i need you i needed you let's go to one quotation from ellen white written 150 years ago we were brought into existence 
we were brought into existence, and I want you to read the underscored part, all of us together. We were brought into existence because we were needed. We were needed. <clears throat> and so he decided. God decided in that eternal council. I need it. I need man. I need woman. I need you. We were brought into existence because we were needed. He planned. He waited for us. Before you were born, he said, this boy is coming. I need him. This girl is coming. I need her. You're not an accident. We were brought into existence because we were needed. And so, he made each one of us so unique, so special. There is no one else like me in this entire universe. No one like you in this universe. You are special. And so God says, if I lose you, I lose you forever. I will not have anyone else like you. But you say, how is it possible? Am I really needed? God has billions of people. There are 6.7 billion people on this planet, on this earth. How am I special to him? How am I special? How does God, why does God need me? I want you to go to one more quote from Steps to Christ. It's found on page 100. The relations between God and each soul, okay? The relations between God and you, between God and me, together on the underscored part, all of us, are so distinct and full as though they were not another soul upon the earth. You and I, as if there's no one else. God says, you, you, you are mine. You are mine. He created us because he needed us. Often I thought, I needed God. Yes, I need God. But this tells me, God needs me. God needs you. Not just to do some work for him. No. He created us for his pleasure to have fellowship with him. To understand him, to love him, so that he may love me, he may understand me. When husbands feel needed, or wives feel needed by the husbands, there is true expression of love. When children feel needed, when parents feel needed by the children, there will be no generation gap. Need, being needed is, is one of the human needs. We feel good when we are needed. God not only longs that we understand him and we love him, but he longs, he also longs that he be understood and loved. Think of the many Bible characters. I'm thinking of Enoch. The Bible says about Enoch, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. That relationship between Enoch and God was so, so intimate, so close, that at the end of it, God said, come home. We need to continue walking together for eternity. And Enoch pleased God. And God pleased Enoch. I'm thinking of Abraham. The Bible says of Abraham, Abraham was called the friend of God. And God said, Abraham is my friend. He's my friend. Because Abraham pleased God. Abraham had that intimate relationship with God. 
I'm thinking of the time when Abraham and God were together. And on that hot afternoon, three visitors visited, uh, they were walking by Abraham's tent and Abraham invites him. Come, take some rest, eat something, drink something, and you may continue your journey. On that day, God says of, of Abraham, how can I hide this from, from Abraham? How can I hide this? He's my friend. When you have an intimate friend, you don't want to hide anything from him or from her. He's my friend. How can I hide this? And so God decides to get into a conversation with Abraham. I'm going to, the, to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of these reasons. And then we find Abraham in a conversation with God. God, if only there are 50, will you spare this city? And God says, sure, Abraham. And Abraham decides, uh, maybe there will not be, there may not be 50 righteous. How about God if there are 45? Sure. And the number goes down, 40 and 30 and 20. God says, sure. And Abraham says, God, one more time. You see that intimate conversation with, between these two friends, God and Abraham? Abraham, in a way, was sharing God's passion. God's passion for the lost. And as a father, God, God's heart was so delighted. Hey, this friend of mine has a has the same heart like mine. Think of Moses. The Bible says of Moses, Moses is my servant. It's only Moses who saw God face to face. And Moses asked God, I want to see your face. And God, like a, a loving father, a good friend, says, hey Moses, no man can see me and yet live. Yet, because you're my friend, because we share an intimate relationship, uh, I, will, I will hide you and I will pass by. You will see my back. What, what, a, what a God who, who comes so close to humanity, to each one of us. He not only wants us wants to love us, but he wants us to love him, understand him. He, fe he, wants, he feels needed by us, that we may need him just as he needs us. And on that mountain when Moses was alone with God, giving the Ten Commandments, God said to Moses, your people down there, your people, have brought disgrace to my name. I'm going to destroy all of them. I will raise up a new generation from you, Moses. And there we find again Moses sharing God's passion. God, what will, what will those nations think about you? I'm worried about your honor. What will they think about you? God, if you want, if you want to de destroy all of them, blot out my name first. You see God coming so close to his people. My question before I close, my friends. Yes, God had a special place for Enoch, for Abraham, for Moses, and likewise, in his heart, in his, a place in his, in his heart. So does God have a place, God has a place in his heart for you, for you. You can't take the place of Enoch in God's heart. Neither can Enoch take your place in God's heart. Amen? Amen. You can't take the place of 
Abraham in God's heart, neither can Abraham take your place. Each one of us has a place in God's heart. Though he has 6.7 billion on this earth right now, you have a place in his heart. I have a place in his heart. How does that work? Imagine a family of uh, eight children. Christian parents, father and mother, did their best in bringing up these eight children into their teens and twenties. Eight, uh, seven out of eight children, they, they, have, they have done pretty well. They have become good children, loving God, loving his church, faithful. But one of one boy of those eight became a rascal. Or disrespected parents, elders, and uh, turned against God. Imagine, imagine, on a Christmas day, or for the birthday of parents, or an their anniversary, some, some occasion in the family. Let's imagine the family is meeting together. And so, here comes their firstborn son, firstborn daughter. Father and mother are extremely happy because they're, they're happy for, for their children. They have grown up to be productive, grown up to be con grown up, have grown up to contribute to society. Father and mother are very happy. Will the father go to the mother and say, Mother, We've done pretty well. We had eight children. And out of eight, seven are, have turned out to be good. Majority. It's only one. If he comes home, we will accept him. Otherwise, we should not be worried about him. What, ha what is happening to him, what he is doing, should not break our hearts. Will a father ever say that? If a father says, will a mother accept? Of course no. On that day now, they're seated around the table. Father and mother are extremely delighted. Seven children are there. And you're watching them very closely. And you see the mother. And you observe closely. There is a tear trickling down her, her cheek and you see another tear another and you ask hey are, are you not happy because you have your seven children with you she says I am I am happy I'm happy but you understand she has a place for that boy out there out in the world somewhere. He has a place in the mother's heart. If that's true of a mother, what about God who made mothers? So this morning, my friend, my brother, my sister, I'm, I'm standing here to remind you, you are special. You are unique. You were brought into existence because you were needed by the Most High. And so this morning, God says, yes, you have a place in my heart. He says, do I have a place in your heart? Do I have a place in your heart? If you want to say to God, God, yes, I understand I am of value to you. That's the reason why when I sinned against you, when I turned my back, you came. You were willing to pay that price. You were willing to go to that cross for my sake. To bear that shame, that pain, that guilt for my sake. I'm, I have a place in my heart for you. If that's your choice, I want you to stand.
And I want you to say to God, tell him he is by your side. I want you to tell him. Every head bowed and eyes closed. Say a prayer to God. Thank him because you are needed. You are wanted by him. He made you. You are special. You are unique. You are of value and worth. He wants to have that intimate relationship with you. Tell him that, God, I want to have an intimate relationship with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that you have made us because you needed us. We thank you that each one of us has a place in your heart. We stood to, to tell you and to tell to the world that we have a significant place in our hearts for you. Father, we thank you. We thank you. And we ask that you will continue to help us to have an intimate, personal relationship with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.